Waikato. Before we begin, since the topic is about justice, I would like to acknowledge the custodians of the land that we live on and on behalf of a seventh generation Australian whose ancestors may have been part of the oppression, apologise on behalf of us white people who took over this land unjustly. Um, my topic, Unbreakable Social Justice Through Emotional Resilience, and I was you know, really excited that our last keynote speaker talked about Fitra, because my whole program is about us and children coming back to our Fitra, being connected um, with our Fitra. So awesome. And it all, I, I see the solution um, to social injustice is everyone having hope because underneath injustice or as we were talking about yesterday oppression and uh, darkness and all the other words for injustice it, it comes from the injustices others have, have experienced so you know hurt breeds hurt oppression breeds oppression so I think at the bottom of all of this is <coughs> where we end up having oppression or injustices comes from when somebody um, has lost hope and that the first thing we need is hope, which is the whole reason I wrote this book. This whole this book is to give uh, Muslim women hope, no matter what they're going through. Um, my history, just very briefly, is I went through a childhood of all different types of abuse, and I ended up in a, a domestic violent, um, abusive marriage, and um, straight after embracing Islam, spent nine years in that marriage and left that marriage pretty much physically almost dead, which was the whole reason why I left was because the doctor actually said to me, who's gonna look after your kids if you die? And that kind of knocked some sense into me that what I was living through wasn't okay. Emotionally, I completely shut down because it hurt too much to feel. And spiritually, I was hanging on to a thread and it was that thread that kept me going. And that's why it's called Step Out and Brace the Leader Within because I had to step up out of that situation and rebuild my life pretty much and with my and my children. So I had three <coughs> children at that stage as well from scratch. And so that's why I'm so passionate about this work because I feel that if we have hope, if we have emotional resilience, we're gonna have less of these problems. And um, especially if we are able to help our kids be more emotionally resilient, they're going to be less likely to, to be the ones that cause the oppression when, when they grow up. I, um, these are just takeaways from yesterday, which I feel really relate to how what I have to offer is, is part of the solution. So the Mufti said social justice is in ourselves first, and that's one of the messages I want to share today. The opposite of social justice is injustice, <laughs> oppression and darkness, and I want to talk about oppression today. Um, better the bitter truth than fooling ourselves. I really want to actually really talk truthfully about our, our, all of our roles in being oppressive. The need to educate our students to have strong Islamic character, knowledge, life skills, contribute, to think critically. This was what Professor Abdullah Saeed shared. Well, I mean, that's not the only thing. These were just a few snippets that I took. And what I believe is if our students are uh, connected well with their fitra, then they will be able to achieve this. Um, balance and excessive regulation. Finding that balance, I believe, comes from our fitra. That we don't have to learn where that is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already inbuilt that in us and that we just can't see it. Religious-based bullying and need for teacher education. I, again, this is what I will be sharing with you, the work that I do. Um, Tasman um, talked about suffocation, overwhelm, uns being unseen, disoriented, and I loved her messy life world description because this is what our kids are experiencing and they need help with. Um, the concerning 5% of bullies, the two Deborah spoke about, we want to start preventing getting having those that 5% by giving them resilience in the first place. Tipping points, that she talked about the tipping points, which was what tipped them over the edge. Um, and so we want to prevent them having a tipping point to tip over the edge. And then she asked the question, why change? We want to give them a reason. 
and I'm, I'm hoping that I'll share with you a re re reason. Um, Iman shared about the liability of teachers, like we have a responsibility to students that we're not pro projecting social injustice on them ourselves. And the Mufti then concluded last night that we want to develop citizens from our schools who have a higher objective nurture to have, a mo have noble objectives. And I'm hoping that what I share today will cover off these points. So where does oppression begin? I already said that, you know, oppression breeds oppression, hurt breeds hurt. The oppression, oppression begins for kids when they're, they're, when they're confused by the adults in their life. As we learned in the keynote speech, children are born with that innate natural resilience, that connection to Allah, that belief, that, that knowing of the difference between right and wrong. They have a real strong sense of injustice and they know the truth intuitively. But when they come to us adults with what they understand intuitively to be the truth and we contradict that, we create confusion because they're getting one message from the adults who are their caretakers, their teachers, their parents, whoever in their life, but their inner fitra, their inner system, it says, but that's not what I understand. And then that develops the confusion and that's where the very first oppression begins. So I just took a couple of meanings that I found around Fitra and how I want us to look at it today. Um, so the definition, the word Fitra comes from the Arabic radicals Fatara. Literal meaning creation, the causing of a thing to exist for the first time. Technical meaning that we've been born as a believer in Allah, the Almighty. And it is a natural tendency for humans to believe in Allah regardless of their belief, including the atheist. And one of the analogies that I've heard used is when somebody who, who identifies as not believing in God and they end up in a calamity, like maybe they're drowning, what do they actually say in that moment? Oh God, it's a natural instinct in us to seek out God. So that is in each and every one of us. And that we, we come in this pure way. And our job as adults is not to corrupt that. My whole message when I teach parenting is teaching parents to not corrupt the fitra of their, their children as opposed to teaching them how to parent. It's like teaching them how not to do certain things that, that are harming that. So the natural instinct to worship God alone, the belief that every child is born Muslim in a state of purity and that it's the society which causes them to drift and that's what we want to talk about today is not being a part of the society that causes them to drift, but part of the society that causes them to stay on the fitra, inshallah. So I call this the innocent oppression. The oppression that we are as adults placing on children innocently. I say it's innocent because we don't realise we're doing it. And I'm going to unpack some of this so you understand what I'm talking about. But when a child is misbehaving, as we would call it, I just call it off-track behaviour, I take all the labels out now. When a child is misbehaving, that child most often is actually saying to us, my world isn't okay, I need your help. What do we do? We punish them, we send them to time out, we disconnect with them, instead of helping them back on track. Most of the time when children are acting up, it's their cry for help. It's their way of saying, my world isn't working out for me right now. I need an adult's help. And so our innocent oppression is where we're misunderstanding what children are telling us. And so we're behaving in a way to them that is causing them harm. And so I want us to stop harming children because then they actually, like when you stop, when we stop talking and we start listening to kids, they are so intelligent. MashaAllah, they're, they're more intelligent than us because we've, we've gone through so many life experiences that we've been blinded. But they can see so clearly, SubhanAllah. So I call this the innocent oppression because we don't understand we're doing this. We're taught so many things that aren't okay. And we believe them because that's what we were taught. 
So it's the accidental corruption of our children's fitra and our own because we're also oppressing our own, own selves. So what I want to do is talk about the inside out paradigm, which is a psychological paradigm that it, or a paradigm is something which is a universal truth. Just like if I throw this ball up, it's going to come down. It's the law of gravity. What I'm going to share with you is the law of psychology, the law of our human nature and how we work. So it's a very, very a small <laughs> sentence, but it has huge wide, profound implications. Feelings can be felt in the moment and nowhere else. It looks to us like it's that person saying something or this situation or something that is creating the way we feel. But it's actually the way we are thinking about that situation that creates the feeling that we have. It's why you can have two different people experiencing the same thing but having completely different reactions because it's their thought about it that is creating the feelings that they're having. And this is the fundamental truth of our psychology that makes all the difference. When we have clarity of this, we don't need to be oppressed by anyone. I used to be someone who was oppressed by everyone. I could not say no to anyone. I was a people pleaser. I would rescue people. I was not psychologically very sound. And now, you know, I don't, alhamdulillah, have this problem anymore because I realize that if I am pleasing Allah, if I am not transgressing anybody's rights and I am speaking truthfully and that person is having a reaction about it, that's coming from there thinking in the moment, not anything I did wrong, so I don't have to take responsibility for it, and it frees me to be me. Feelings come from thought in the moment. These bubbles represent our thoughts. Thoughts are coming through our head constantly, all the time. We have apparently 60 to 70,000 thoughts a day, but we probably only think, notice or remember like that many of them, right? Just like these bubbles, we have no control over them. They come randomly all the time. And just like these bubbles, they go. They come and they pop, they go. What I'm demonstrating here are the tools that I use to teach this to the kids. But what we're covering in this short session is about four lessons that we do with the kids. So you can imagine when we get bubble machines out and things like that, they love it. And I ask the kids, you know, to describe the bubbles. So they say, oh, you know, they're all different sizes, they're coming quickly, we have no control over them, they're just coming all the time. I said, yes, and that's how our thinking is. That's how our thoughts are. And that's how they're meant to be. They're meant to keep flowing, right? The problem comes, so the problem comes when we hang on to thought, right? When we hang on to something and we ruminate over something, it starts to become a burden. So if we have some stressful thinking and we hang on to the stressful thinking, it's kind of like this balloon. And you can imagine a whole class of kids blowing up their balloons. We have heaps of fun with balloons. There's lots of activities we do with balloons. <laughs> I should have got a volunteer for this bit. <laughs> So anyway, I'm not going to blow it up to the end, but what I get the kids to do is blow it up until it pops. <laughs> There's no sleeping in this class. And what that shows them is what's, what it's like when you keep holding on and holding on and holding on and holding on until either psychologically or physically you pop. Like you might have a panic attack or an anxiety attack or you might end up with some physical kind of ailment. So I get them to get another balloon, blow it up a little bit because of course sometimes we do hang on to a fort a, a little bit and then let it go. What happens? It returns back to its original state and that's how it's meant to be. But the problem is this is representing what I call spark in the curriculum. It comes from a spark curriculum, and this represents our fitra, right? Our fitra, our spark inside. The whole curriculum's around them knowing that they've got this 
compass inside of them that's always pointing them to right, that's guiding them, that is where um, they can get all their creativity, their intuition to really feel that spark. And so, where did I put my boiling water? So what I show them, and these tea lights are actually waterproof. is if this tea bag here, English breakfast, represents doomy and gloomy thoughts. And this tea bag, which is pomegranate, represents lots of loving, loving thoughts. We're just gonna leave those for a while and they're just going to ruminate, right? While we're ruminating, we'll come back to that because we haven't got time to wait for it. I'm going to share with you another thing that we do with them. We've got five minutes. Wow, that went so quick. All right, I'm going to do the super fast version. I've got some videos I need you to see at the end. Okay, so I did a thing with the quick kids, and they told me all the things that bother them, like annoying people, bad news, teachers, death, all these things. And we do this activity. What I do is turn this spark on first. And then we put each of the cups in turn over the top and that represents you know where they can't see it where it looks like nothing's okay and then we take it off and we go but it's still on it's still there it's always still inside you it's a very very hopeful way of explaining things to kids so as you can see what's happening here is the tea lights that are ruminating here in the black tea and the red tea are getting dimmer while the one that's still got clear thinking is still shining bright and so we're showing here that sometimes when we have overwhelming feelings and they don't have to be just all negative feelings they can be good feelings too we get disconnected from our fitra and so we don't make good decisions then we make mistakes and that's being aware that the this was some pictures taken with working with the year sevens and as you can see we're doing paper planes and balloons they love coming to my classes <laughs> and they're learning at the same time this is my year sixes just sharing what they have learned so far in the first six weeks of of doing the program and learning about emotional emotional health we learned about spark everyone has their own spark it is always there even if we've got it Sometimes we listen to our spark and sometimes we don't. Our spark is our fitra, our natural state of being connected to Allah. My classroom will present to you how our spark will help us. My spark taught me that um, how to love myself and I'm perfect the way I am. My spark helps me with choosing the right decision, always be myself, be a good person, and don't be shy to say my words. I learned that my spark helps me be humble, be kind, be creative, be small, patient, forgiving, organized, and most importantly, lovable. I, I learned that my spark helps me motiva motivate myself to be better and get more done. I learned that my spark has helped me to be mindful and respectful for others, and I also learned that mindful doesn't mean to fill up your mind, but it means to empty it. I learned that my spark helps me in everything I do. It's a guide. It's like a guide for me, a guide to the straight path. It tells me from right or wrong. It's a blessing from Allah. I learned that my spark helps me to calm down, to learn respect, to be humble, and to be more interactive. They were all their own words. I asked them to write down what they had learned over the six weeks. They were all their own words. And the last thing that I want to show you, it's all gone blank, uh, is this video, which is from the women, including um, Janine here, who are in my program. <laughs> It's just an automatic understanding that happens when we understand that our feelings are coming from thought in the moment at all times. That this helps us with, with showing up with neutrality, showing up with kindness, with compassion, with um, offering uh, uh, from a space of um, non-judgment.
Uh, you don't need to understand why other people think the way they think in order to let go of your reaction to it. I love the energy and the pretty much instant change, uh, positive change in our lives that come from internalising that realisation. My overall physical experience then changed. You know, I felt happy. I felt, you know, it's like in my body felt good. You know, have a shower. And just, wow, I'm re moving really good. And then, you know, then you're like, oh, wow, you look outside. You go, oh, wow, the sun is shining. The birds are chirping. Whereas, I don't know, it was all of a sudden like there was a lampshade taken off my head or something. I'm not, I'm not, I don't really know how to, to explain it. That I've taken responsibility for my feelings and for the way I interact with others. It, it definitely increased my trust in Allah. Having an intimate relationship with Allah, that was something that I had missed, I think, for the first few years um, of being Muslim. But now, yeah, peacefulness has been the one thing that has helped me with my own self. Um, with my, you know, with my husband and my son and my family, it's helped bring that connection back, which, yeah, before, you know, it would have, yeah, I, I don't know what would have happened. It's like seeing the light. It's like seeing, it's like seeing all shades of yourself, like the, even the shadowy parts of yourself that you were never able to acknowledge or realise before. What would they be missing out on if if they didn't have this understanding? They're missing out on they're missing out on so much, so much beauty that the world can give, so much love. That I'm always okay, even if there is chaos around me. You know, I want for somebody else what I've got for myself. You know, we should always want for our, our brothers or our sisters what we have for ourselves, and that is that inner peace. Whatever you think your problem is. <laughs> The Inside Out paradigm is a game changer. I don't the be all and end all, you know, it's pretty awesome. So as you can see, the thinking's all gone away without us doing anything. And I guess what I want to leave you with is that we need to work on ourselves as adults, that we're not corrupting children with our own emotions, when we're not seeing clearly, when our fitzer has been covered up by what's going on for us, and help our children preserve their natural fitna. A fitra, fitna? <laughs> fitra, kind of the opposite <laughs> word. <Yeah. laughs> Thank you very much, and sorry to rush you through all of that. <laughs>